As we turn to God's word in Exodus chapter 17, uh, let me pray and then we can uh, hear from God's word. Father, we come to you and ask that you would speak either in the stillness or in the disquiet of our home and that by your spirit you would be pleased to shine light so that we would receive the words of life and truth, that you would be greatly praised and glorified in our lives and in our church, so that Christ would be seen by many within our community, within our own family, and to the ends of the earth. So teach us your word, we pray, and we come to you with humble dependence. In Jesus' name, amen. So it happens. Um, Every year on February the 2nd, uh, February the 2nd in Punxsutawney in Pennsylvania, people gather to see a particular creature called Punxsutawney Phil, and he is a groundhog. That's right, in two days' time, we will actually have come to Groundhog Day. Um, potentially, we have felt that it has been Groundhog Day um, pretty much the last 10 months. Um, I'm sure that many of us have had that experience during this year. We uh, feel a little bit like Bill Murray in the 90s comedy that every day we wake up and it feels as if we're doing the same thing day in and day out. Day after day, we repeat the same events. In one sense, we shouldn't be surprised. Yes, our circumstances are quite unique in comparison to many other uh, times in uh, world history. Our repetition comes as the result of nationwide political decisions. That is something which is, is quite unique in our circumstances. But for the people of God in the wilderness, days seem to be repeating themselves, don't they? It seems like it's just the same thing that's happening again in chapter 17 as it was in chapter 15 and 16. Similar events. Martin, is this just the same as last Sunday? Is this just the same stuff that we're about to learn? Well, yes and no. What I want us to see this morning in this passage is that God is laying foundations about his character and his purposes, which his people must respond to in the wilderness. Because what we have here on display again is nothing other than God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness is on display and there are aspects about God's character and his purposes that the people of God need to learn as they are in the wilderness. To help us navigate this section we've got three points that will hopefully provide us a structure to move things forward and the first point is this we need to understand that there is a question which exposes the heart there is a question in this passage which exposes the heart of the people of God and also the people of God today. So to get that, we need to go to the middle of the chapter. We need to go to chapter 17, verse 7, and see the question which exposes the heart. To get the handle on this, this middle question, is this, it becomes the centre point of the passage. It's the bit where everything revolves around, and it is quite a question, isn't it? Is the Lord among us or not? This is the big question that's revolving round in the heads and the hearts of the people of God in the wilderness. It is quite a question, especially when you think about what has been happening in their lives up to this point over the last few months. In Egypt, they were protected from plagues. They had been set free from lives of slavery and abuse under the Egyptian rule. God had not only taken them out from there, but he had smashed open their seas, he had parted them before their eyes, and he had overthrown Pharaoh's army during that whole process. Not only that, as we saw last week, on top of all of this, they had been provided food and water in the wilderness. The people and the livestock had been provided for by God. They all survive and still this question comes, is the Lord among us or not? You know, I can't help but hearing that question and imagine that the, the, the men who are asking this question have got crumbs of manna hanging on their beard. It is ironic. It is really interesting, isn't it? 
they've got these things all around about them. They've had these events which have happened not long ago, a few days, a few weeks, a few months ago, and they can still ask this question, is the Lord actually among us or not? Of course he is. Of course he's amongst them. They are still alive and they are no longer in Egypt. What has happened to say anything other than the fact that God is present with them? Now, from a distance, historically, like us here today, we could be asking this question, how could these people not see that God is so clearly with them? And yet, realistically, I'm guessing that there's not one of us who's listening here this morning who have proven to be any different to God's people in the wilderness during this time. How can I say that? How can I say that? Because underlying the testing of God, which is what the people are doing here, and Moses identifies that. Through this, uh, this testing of God is this belief that the people would be better served to provide and to protect themselves. God ultimately is not doing as good a job, and it would be better for us to provide for ourselves because we would do it in a better way. You see, this is as old as Eden, and it's as relative as uh, relevant as this moment. Instead of recognizing what God has done and how he has provided for us, we can entertain the deception of being people who would do a better job than God. We can begin to entertain this deception that, do you know what? I think I would actually do this better. The circumstances we find ourselves in are not quite ideal. And, and if I had my way, they would be like this or that or the next thing. And ultimately in saying that, we are saying, I would do a better job than how God has sorted things out. In short, we begin to travel this path which leads to idolatry, thinking that we are comparable or greater than God. And yet we are never happy, never truly satisfied until we truly know God. The things which we make in our own image and the things which have been created in the world around about us that we can have the temptation to bow down before ultimately are things which will never provide for us lasting satisfaction, true hope and eternal joy. You see, there is only one person who does not put the Lord to the test and it is Christ Jesus. He exemplifies what it means to be truly human. He does not turn around in response to God and say, what is it you're doing? I don't want to do this stuff. He willingly and lovingly depends on God, his Father. He knows and believes the purposes of God, and even though it brings him to unbearable anguish in the garden in Gethsemane before uh, the cross on his night of betrayal, we see that he is willing and obedient, not questioning in one sense whether the Lord is with him or not, but inviting, the, but stating clearly that he is submissive to the will of God. And that surely makes us ask a question, doesn't it? I'm not saying we are Christ, but I'm saying that there is something we need to learn here, and it is this, do I know God? And if I do, do I trust in his purposes? You see, it's one thing for us to mouth an answer of agreement. We can say, oh yeah, I know God and I understand something of his purposes. But it's quite another to put those words and those thoughts into action and into practice in our everyday lives. Particularly in rhythms of life which feel like Groundhog Day. I know God, I trust his promises. Yeah, but what happens when you're just repeating the same thing after the same thing after the same thing and it just feels like there's never any end and it's just monotony? Friends, I want to stress this for each of us this morning. God is amongst us. God is present with us. Perhaps not in the way that we would want him to be and perhaps not leading us in the direction we would choose, but he is present with us. You see, the thing is, because we are not necessarily going the way we would choose, that is the beauty of him being God and not us. He gets to set the trajectory. He gets to set the, the path that we are walking along because he ultimately knows the end from the beginning 
and understands what is of ultimate worth and good for his people, for those who don't yet trust him and for those of us who love him. God ultimately wants to see his glory displayed and seen in the world. And so he orders things in such a way that it is beneficial and good for our salvation, as we read in the Catechism earlier on, but it is ultimately beneficial to the many peoples in Scotland and throughout the world who don't yet know him, to have that opportunity to come and hear him. So let's ask the question again, do I trust God's character and his purposes? And if I can say yes, do I trust his character and purposes to be good? Not to turn around and test him and say, are you actually here with us? But to look to Christ and recognize that he is present with us by the power of his spirit. God's purposes and character are good and he desires that question of our heart to be answered. Not that we test him, but that we trust him. So the second thing to help us with a framework of this passage goes back to the beginning. We move from verse 7 back to the beginning and look at chapter 17 verses 1 to 6 because the question comes in the middle and it acts as a nice hinge point to, to latch these two sections together. Now here's something that I want to say for us. Some people would look at this section and they'll say, well, this is just the Bible showing that it's just made up again. It's a fairy story and the guys who are writing this don't even have a clue that they're just repeating the same stories. They're chucking things in left, right and centre and they actually have no real understanding about what this truly is. The writers don't realise that all they're doing is repeating what's happened in chapter 16. Now some people may say that but I think that that's quite a shallow view of the, this, this passage. I don't think that, that actually makes sense and also I think for one main reason that is a shallow reading of this passage, because if we were to take the opinion that this is just some random people recording the same story again and, you know, they've just forgotten and it's all been chucked together in a hodgepodge, we actually fail to do justice to the accuracy of the Bible's um, prognosis on the human, the human condition, on humanity's response, on human behaviour, because you see, human behaviour, if taken seriously, will show that we often repeat the same challenges and mistakes. Even though we go into different circumstances, they can be similar and the same things can happen to us and actually we tend to come out with the same response. Think about it this way. For a toddler, how many times do you have to tell them, do you know what, you probably shouldn't do that. You wake up day three and the same thing pretty much happens. And you wake up day 54 and the same thing, you have to tell them probably shouldn't be doing that. And day 145 and it's roughly the same sort of thing. Day after day, they don't listen, they're in similar circumstances, and they don't actually take on board what it is that they're supposed to be learning. But let's notch it up a gear, because as adults, that can often be our experience as well. We can return time and again to the mistakes of our past. We fall for the grass is greener mentality and buy into a green and fantasy world out there somewhere. We can pursue toxic relationships and we can also chase after promotion and accumulation as if it's somehow going to make us happy in the end. And yet with all of these things, we know that they don't. And yet we can often find ourselves repeating mistakes that we have made. Now part of the the teaching of this bridge section between the sea, which has been split open, and the mountain where God will make his covenant is teaching us that people are fickle, that God's people are not immune to this, and that they often make the same mistakes when placed in similar circumstances. But it is also teaching us something about God's purposes for his people. Here is a provision which provides salvation. It is a provision which provides salvation for his people. We would like to think that following God would lead us into a peaceful and prosperous way of life. That can often be how we think. More often than not, we can be practical prosperity preachers in our own lives. Now, we're not going to speak like that. We're not going to communicate that necessarily. We would maybe never even admit it, but we can all be tempted to have the expectation that God will see us through to, to heaven, to the new creation, there'd be a few bumps on the way, but eventually we'll get there. And yet the Bible never promises us that to be true. 
The Bible so clearly tells us you're to take up a cross and follow Christ. That life will have suffering and great challenges will come our way. And that's what we see, isn't it, in this passage? Once again, there is confusion amongst God's people. They blame Moses, and they do so in a very forceful way. Chapter 17, verse 3, it's, it's a step up, it's a gear up from chapter 15 and 16. Uh, not only the, the Hebrew terminology for it is more of a, a, a legal accusation that they're bringing to Moses. They're saying, you are wrong. They're actually being very forceful in what they're saying. You can see that in what they say. Why did you bring us out here to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? What is their problem? They want Moses to provide water. They're a little bit like Veruca Salt from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I don't know if you watch the film during Christmas. It tends to be something we do. But what is her song? Don't care how. I want it now. That is what people are saying. To Moses, provide us water in the midst of the desert. Do it now, because you're going to kill us all. But you see, they have a problem. They make the same mistake that they have already made. They presume that Moses has brought them here, and that's what they've done all along. They presume that Moses is in control, when actually he is simply taking the direction from the Lord. Look at that. Direction and location are given. Chapter 17, verse 1, from the Lord. This is the Lord's command that they move to this place. So there is an obvious and clear question, isn't there? Why has God directed them to a place where there is no water? Why has God directed them to a place where they can't be provided for themselves? Well, the answer is this, to display his faithfulness publicly. God has not lost his place in the map. He is deliberately bringing his people to this place to provide for them in a miraculous way. And he does that in chapter 17, verses 5 to 6. The people, uh, the elders are to be taken out to uh, a rock in the wilderness and there is going to be a miraculous provision. Previously, God made bitter water sweet and suitable to drink. Now he is taking them to Horeb which most literally means the desolate place, in search of water. It's not, in one sense, it's not good enough for God to have them simply in the wilderness in Rephidim. He wants to take the elders, the leaders, further into the wilderness to an even more desolate place and show them, I will be able to provide. You see, the, the point is this. God will be able to provide exactly what the people need, even when it looks like he cannot provide at all. God takes his people to the last place they would look for provision so that they would realize that only he can meet their deepest needs. This is God's provision which provides salvation for his people in the wilderness. And this is ultimately at the heart of Christianity, isn't it? There is no way for people to provide for themselves. There is no means through which people can make themselves right with God. But God is the one who opens up a way. God is the one who shows us how to make it right with him. And we see that supremely in the body and the blood of Christ Jesus. In a similar way to the rock being struck with a staff, which brought plagues of judgment on Egypt, so too Christ is struck by the wrath of God against sin. And from this strike there flows unending waters of life which provide salvation for people who will simply come to him and drink from him. You see, Christ is struck down once in a similar way to this rock being struck once. And through his death, once for all, he has dealt with our greatest need, which is to be made right with God. Can I just say to you, if you're listening this morning, that is your greatest need. It's not whether or not you're going to die as a result of this virus. It's whether or not you're going to meet God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ or not. You may be reading this section and think, Martin, how do you get this from this? It's nothing to do with this whatsoever. Can I invite you to turn with me to the New Testament, to a letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read verse 1 to 6, because this is what Paul makes sense of this passage. This is how Paul makes sense of this passage we're reading this morning. 
he says this in chapter 10, verses 1 to 6 in 1 Corinthians. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples or types for us that we may not desire evil as they did. This seems to be the way that Paul makes sense of this passage. This seems to be one of the big teaching points that God is trying to make for his people. I will provide for you and it will come through the strike to a rock. If we are looking for water in the desert, we wouldn't go to the desolate place, would we? It's not the sort of thing that's programmed into us. We wouldn't say, hey, let's go further into the desert to find water. And if we're looking for hope in life as it is in the present, in perpetual Groundhog Day, we would not look to a first century man who was executed by Roman soldiers and rejected by his people. But that is exactly what we are supposed to do. Exactly what we are supposed to do. The place which is absolutely idiotic in the human sense to find hope and life-giving water is the place that we're supposed to go to. To a man executed by Roman soldiers, rejected by his people, hit down with the wrath of God, and yet was raised to new life by the Spirit. Can I urge you, whether you know Jesus or whether you do not know Jesus, to come and find in the one who suffered for you the wrath of God, to provide for you salvation, can I ask you and urge you, please come to him and find rest for your soul. Whatever else it is you think is water in the wilderness, it will ultimately let you down. It will eventually fail you and it will run out of its supply. Take this not just simply from me, but ask others involved with our church community. Also listen to the words of a, a young hedonistic man. He said this about, when, uh, about turning and coming to know God. He said this, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. God has given us a perfect provision. And that young man who was a hedonist turned out to be one of the greatest leaders in the early church. His name was St. Augustine. And he led many people to understand the grace of God when he turned away from false wells of hope and prosperity. You see, you were made, believer or non-believer, you were made to know God. You were made to depend on him and to find rest in him. And so here is the question, will you hear his welcome? Will you see his open arms and will you come to him even in the wilderness of a perpetual groundhog day? He is willing and waiting. Are we going to come to him? The third thing that gives us our framework is a plan which reveals dependence in chapter 17, verse 8 to 16, the last section. Food and water are not the only problem which faces the people of God now that they are out of Egypt. Can they survive being attacked? And was God's victory against Egypt simply a one-off event, a one-time thing which could never be repeated? I want us to notice something quite important here. Moses doesn't actually stop to ask God what he should do in this situation. And that's quite interesting. Although we could look at this and think, hey, Moses has made a mistake here. I don't think that's what we're supposed to see. I don't think that's to be our observation. Instead, what we see is a plan which reveals dependence on part of Moses. There may not be a direct reference to Moses stopping to ask the Lord. However, his plan to protect the people is filled with godly wisdom and humility. After all, the Lord has been training Moses all throughout his life in this dependence. And recently, just even a, a few weeks ago, a month or so ago, there was the Red Sea incident where Moses had to trust on the Lord for a battle plan, which would prove for the salvation of God's people. Now look at his strategic outline. Joshua is to take suitable men to fight in chapter 17, verse 9, first half. 
whilst he stands at the top of the hill, that is Moses, raising the staff of God in the air, the second half of verse 9. Moses doesn't turn around to the people and say, hey, see these guys who are coming to attack us? Well, let's go out there and show them what we're made of. Let's go out there and sort them out ourselves. We will deal with it all. Now, what he says is something more like this. He says, we will deal with this threat which is coming against us in unity as a people and in full cooperation with the Lord. We will be prepared to fight, but we will do so in dependence on the Lord. Joshua gets some men ready and I'm going up the hill and I will intercede for the people. Everything about the plan which is put into action by Moses is flavoured with dependence on the Lord, which has been learnt through obedience in the desert. Moses is, ex- he is acting as a, a chief example of what it is the people are supposed to have been learning. That the, that the God of Israel is dependable. That the Lord who has revealed himself is dependable. Even the fact that Moses doesn't go up the hill by himself as some hero who's going to save everyone. He doesn't go up by himself, he recognizes his weakness and he takes others up the hill with him, shows godly dependence and wisdom. You see that in verses 10 to 12 of chapter 17. And how does this conflict end? Well, it concludes with Moses' plan being vindicated by God's power, working to save his people in battle. Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. There is clear divine vindication that the way Moses has led his people, both practically and spiritually, working together, that this was the right thing to do. Once again, God's faithfulness to his people is put on public display. Even though every day so far in the wilderness may have seemed the same for the people of God, they got up They collected manna, they fed the livestock, they moved to the next location. They got up, they got the manna, they fed the livestock, they moved to the next location. Even though it might have felt like a perpetual repetition, Moses was not uh, sleeping, so to speak. Moses was ready to respond to threat and danger. The everyday realities of life had not numbed him from being ready to withstand attacks to the promises, purposes and character of God. But what about us? Are we people who are learning dependence on the Lord day by day so that when the inevitable moment of attack comes, we have a handle on what it is we should do? It's no surprise that the Amalekites have come out to attack the people of God. Ultimately, the enemy of God's people wants to usurp everything which is taking place. He does not want God's purposes to be fulfilled. He does not want there to be a covenant between God and his people at the mountain in a few chapters' time. He does not want them to grow in their knowledge and dependence and love for God because ultimately that will take away people from his, uh, it will take people away from him. They do, he does not want them to grow in dependability on God. He does not want people to repent and trust in Christ Jesus. He does not want people in the church to continue the mission of God and to see it fulfilled even within our generation. He does not want these things to happen. So there will be Amalekites. There will be challenges. There will be clear things which come along which could bring this unity and bring this harmony. The question for us is, are we sleeping or are we numbed in our life so that when those things come along, we don't actually know what to do or we react with such haste and independence instead of trust and faith in the living God? You see, as individuals and as the church, we must resist the temptation to test God when the moment of attack comes. We are not to sit back, relax, and ask God to jump through hoops for us to display that he will overcome because we have been given so clearly the answer that victory rests in Christ Jesus and that obedience to him and to what it is he has asked and invited us to be doing as his people is the life that we are supposed to lead. We are invited by God in Christ to act wisely, to walk humbly in dependence on him when we encounter attack, whether that is personally or corporately, and to trust that no matter what happens, he in the end will redeem his people and will be vindicated as the true and living God. Here are a few practical places for us to think about this worked out. What is your plan in the humdrum of 
Groundhog Day to deal with attacks from sin in your own life? What about attacks from secularism, naturalism, where we place everything under the control of nature instead of remembering that everything ultimately comes under the sovereign control of God? What about self-involvement, where we begin to make everything so small and about our little world, forgetting that there is a whole place out there and we are supposed to see it through the eyes of faith as God has asked us to. And just so that Joshua would not forget all this, we have verses 14 to 16 of the passage. The people of God were not supposed to forget, we are not supposed to forget that God commands uh, that victory would, uh, sorry, Joshua was not to forget, and we are not to forget, God commands that what was to happen, victory through humility, be recorded so that each successive generation recognizes this is the pattern that God has to save his people. Those who are united against the purposes and character of God will ultimately be cut off. Verse 16 of chapter 17. A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And as you see later on in the Old Testament, Amalek are cut off completely from the world. They never survive. They are ended. Here is the message of the gospel. Victory comes through the humiliation of Christ. Victory comes through humility. Victory comes through obedience. Victory comes through dependence, not on ourselves, but comes through dependence on God. It shouldn't surprise us that we are led into similar situations day after day. They may feel like Groundhog Day, but ultimately this happens to teach us as God's people what it means for us to trust in him and to continue walking with him. The question remains for us, though, to answer. During those times where we've been led into repetitive situations, where are we listening to God? Where are we learning about his purposes and growing to love his character more and more? Or were we increasingly caught up in grumbling and wondering what it was all, when it was all going to end and missing the reason for the Lord leading us into this place in the first place? Let me pray and we'll sing. Father, we thank you that you're good and that you're gracious, that your character is dependable and that your purposes are certain and sure. That you have a people for yourself, for your own praise and glory throughout the world, and that we have been chosen to be part of that people. For that, we praise you. But also, Father, this passage searches our heart and shows us that we can often be fickle, that we can often be self-determining, um, we can often be independent, and Father, you invite us not to take that path, but to come to you with dependence, to come to you recognizing that you are the one who holds on to us and it is not the other way around. To come to recognize that there is only one person who can provide salvation to anyone in the wilderness. We worship you and we praise you for him, Jesus Christ, our Savior. So make us more like him, we pray, and lead us and teach us for your glory day after day, even when it feels repetitive, so that when the time comes to stand, we will be enabled by your spirit to do so, and we'll be able to walk with humility and wisdom. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing one last song, He Will Hold Me Fast, which is a wonderful hymn of response and trust in God's wonderful provision. So let me get that up for us, and then we'll finish. <laughs>